Good evening from your news team here at CNN Money Switzerland. I'm Hannah Wise with the main news headlines this Monday evening. The number of cases of coronavirus here and in Switzerland has risen to nearly 28,000 this Monday with the number of deaths of course, still on the rise as well at just over 1,140. This as Novartis reaches an agreement with US regulators to test whether an anti-malaria drug can be used to treat patients with COVID-19. The pharma giant will hold a randomized phase three trial into the use of hydroxychloroquine with plans to recruit 440 patients at sites across the US in the coming weeks. The Swiss National Bank has scaled back efforts to stem the rise of the franc last week, as according to data out this Monday. Now, the bank remains active in currency markets to check the appreciation of the Swiss franc, but a 3 billion franc increase in site deposits shows that they are intervening less than they have done in the previous two weeks. Swiss compensation funds said they have received almost 150,000 requests for loss of earnings from self-employed persons here in Switzerland in connection, of course, with the coronavirus. They expect 100,000 more applications in the coming days. This comes after the Swiss government extended support for independent workers last week. And nearly 60 million jobs across the European Union and the United Kingdom are at risk from the pandemic. That's according to McKinsey. The consulting firm warns that the EU unemployment rate could soar from around 6% to more than 11% and remain elevated for years if the disease is not quickly uh, contained. U.S. oil prices have now dropped to a 21-year low as demand dries up and storage runs out. CNN's John Defterios. The sharp sell-off in oil markets is accelerating again. The cuts put forward by OPEC Plus and the involuntary cuts taking place in the United States and Canada are not enough to meet the falling demand due to the coronavirus. This is particularly acute in the United States, with the U.S. benchmark WTI trading down 10 or more dollars versus the international benchmark North Sea Brent. And that's because we have oversupply of nearly a half a billion barrels a day in the United States, with many suggesting we'll run out of storage in less than a month. And here is the simple math. OPEC Plus plans to cut production by about 10 million barrels a day that will formally go into place May 1st. The International Energy Agency in Paris is suggesting that demand has dropped nearly 30 million barrels a day, or three times that. Now, the cuts by OPEC and other producers, mainly Saudi Arabia and Russia, will eat up 2 billion barrels a day by the end of the year. But investors are looking at the here and now, and it does not look pretty. John Defterius, Abu Dhabi. Now, a tech wearable usually used to track fertility in women could be used to detect early coronavirus symptoms. Swiss med tech company Ava, you may have heard of it, measures things like body temperature and other parameters that aren't covered by your usual wearable or Fitbit or, or Apple Watch. It's now piloting a scheme in Liechtenstein, which could help monitor a second wave of infections predicted for later this year. Anna Maria Montero has more. So we're, we're pretty much starting right now, um, and it really depends on how many cases we will have. So that's kind of the unknown factor here, because we, we need enough cases in order to actually look at the data and, and make sense of it. So that's an unknown. But I think in general, what we're hoping to do here is that we would be ready um, with, with a good analysis for a potential second wave that I think the government is currently expecting to happen in fall this year. And can men wear it too? Man should absolutely wear it too. Man should absolutely wear it too. I mean, this is really the first time that we're we're using our bracelet also for across gender, across age, um, and it really comes down to the fact that we've we've built a sensor bracelet that can detect physiological parameters, and really what we do with it seems to be more more endless than what Ava is currently focused on. And you mentioned that in your study in Liechtenstein, you're basically collecting data, and of course this is. Data collection is at the heart of a very 
uh, there is a very lively discussion happening all over the world um, as we hear of more tracking and tracing devices being used to help detect the spread of the virus. Um, what exactly are you doing with your data? Uh, where does it go? Who is using it? Is the government using it? Yeah, um, it's a really good question. And I'm actually really happy that um, the whole world is currently having this conversation because I think we're seeing that telehealth is becoming more and more important in this situation. So um, the question of where the data goes is important and it's an important question for all of us. Um, in this study, um, the study, so the data that we're collecting um, remains within AVA. Um, we're not sharing that data with the government um, in any way. So it stays within the, within the study court. And I think it's just important to remember um, we're a medical device. We've been handling sensitive data for, for a while now. This is not the first time we're doing it. Um, and, and therefore, we have, we have the infrastructure in place to protect the data accurately and adequately for the, for the use case we have here. So the, the, part of the debate is also at what point do you sacrifice your privacy, your private data um, in the service of, of, of a higher cause, right? In this case would be halting the spread of the coronavirus. Um, I think that's an important question, but it's not really relevant to the current study that we're setting up because the data remains basically um, at the moment within us and then our user. And I mean, even if it's with us, it doesn't mean that I can access it. Um, no one here can access your data because it's anonymized. Um, so it's really data that stays with you in the end. So I don't think in this case, it's a trade-off between tr privacy um, and uh, and fighting the coronavirus. Um, I think on the contrary, I mean, we're really trying, if this whole thing turns out the way that we want it to work out, we might have something in our hands that would allow us to detect an infection earlier than is right now possible. Around 118,000 companies representing more than 1.76 million employees have filed for short-term work in here in Switzerland since the shutdown started back in March. Now it's helped cushion the blow for companies who cannot make money during the lockdown situation. But post coronavirus, some sectors will recover faster than others. Take a listen. The corona pandemic is a stress test for the health system, but also for the job market. Some European countries have systems in place to prevent sharp jumps in unemployment. In Switzerland, the government compensates companies that keep their workers on the payroll during tough times, a program known as short time. The Swiss jobless rate reached 2.9% last month, an increase of 0.4% from the previous month. By contrast, the unemployment rate in the US jumped from 3.5% in February to 4.4% in March, the result of what some experts refer to as a hire and fire mentality. About 118,000 companies, representing more than 1.76 million employees, have filed for the Swiss program since Switzerland went into shutdown in mid-March. According to a recent analysis by ETH, between 2009 and 2015, partial unemployment benefits allowed companies to retain at least 10% of their workforce and prevent layoffs across Switzerland. However, other studies claim that some companies applied for benefits even when they were not needed. According to ADECO Switzerland CEO Nicole Berthschudi, some sectors will recover faster than others post-coronavirus. I personally believe that we will see first um, logistics to, to, to be um, impacted positively, while um, medical and um, IT staff will continue to be in demand. Um, for automotive and uh, sectors like catering, I do believe it will take much longer. Now, in all likelihood, you'll have been working from home in recent weeks, and it's also very likely that your partner has been too. Well, it's a dynamic that experts say could lead to tensions between partners, but maybe you don't need me to tell you that. Anna Maria Montero has been speaking to the author of Couples That Work, an assistant professor at INSEAD on the kinds of conversations you should be having to keep both your work and your life on track. Very often in couples, there is a power imbalance. One person shoulders more of the weight at home with the practical issues, for example, and one person's career is given more priority. We can often juggle that when we're out and about, but when we're day to day, it becomes very clear that there's a power imbalance in our couple, and then the resentment and the conflicts begin. 
Now your tips involve quite a bit of homework, as I understand. Do busy working couples even have time for this kind of thing? I would argue if they don't make time, that's when the issues start. I think sometimes when we talk about couples like having these deep conversations, they think, oh my goodness, I'm gonna need hours, I'm gonna need to sit down, maybe with some wine and sort it out. These are really pockets of 10, 15 minutes of undivided attention, maybe at the end of the day when the children are in bed, and we just take a few minutes to check in. What's going on? Are we really supporting each other? How can we make this better? And I would say if you can't take 10 minutes at the end of the day, then that's where the problems begin. We keep talking about the, what do they call them, coronials, right? All the babies that will be born in at the end of this year, but also might have quite a bit of the opposite, right? Quite a high divorce rate by the end of this. Yeah, I do think so. There is this polarization in couples. We're either coming closer together or we're pulling apart. And we actually see that data actually coming out of China. We can see the divorce rate spiking. When we look at past forced consignments, we see that nine months later, there's a lot of babies and there's a lot of divorces. Mm -hmm. If you could point to one specific solution, one kind of go-to thing that a couple can do, what would that be? It's quite straightforward. Invest in really deliberate conversations around what you need from each other, what your priorities are, and how you can support each other. And investing in those deliberate conversations will pay off. The couples who make it and grow closer together are those who really make the investment in the conversations and try and work it through together. None of us are going to be perfect, but if we struggle through this together, we're more likely to be in the make category. The break category is often people who just keep sweeping things under the carpet and that's when we get the flare up of conflicts, the flare up of resentments and of course then there's the downward spiral. What is a deliberate conversation? It's not just a rundown of the day, how was your day, who's going to buy the milk, it's not necessarily about the practicalities, it's more around the fundamentals. What are we worried about, how can we manage that, who's got what on, how can we structure our days and how can we really support each other so we can get through this in a way where we have our careers intact and also our relationship intact. Do you have deliberate conversations? Yeah, we do actually. And our children are a little bit older, so we involve them in them as well at the dinner table every night. We really talk about our day, what went well, what didn't go well, what have we got on tomorrow and what are the things we all need support with. So it's not just for relationships, it's also something that can be applied to family situations. I think so, if your children are obviously are old enough to engage in those conversations, yeah. All right, well, thank you so much, Jennifer. It was a pleasure, thank you for your insight. You. European football is at a standstill. However, for financial reasons, there's still a big push to finish this season. Matt Layton explains. For the last month, say, European football, soccer leagues have been at a complete standstill, but there are plans to finish the season. Clearly it's to do with money, massive TV broadcast rights. What are the options? Well, you could scrap the season and make it null and void. You could finish the season where the positions are now. Very complicated legally. Also, what will probably happen is they'll decide to finish the season behind closed doors in a very limited time period. Other possibilities? You could quarantine your players, ship them off all to an island. That's very unlikely. Another possibility is you say, let's just play the matches when we can for as long as the season needs to run out. Again, that's very difficult to manage. You have various contracts of players, of sponsors, and clearly we want to start next season as soon as possible. If you go for behind closed doors option, it's still quite complicated because you need at least 150 people in the ground. Security, medical, players, staff, and broadcast technicians all need to be tested, kept apart and potentially looked after. So there's big problems. What's happening in the major leagues? Well, let's run through them briefly. Switzerland, 10 teams in the Super League, 13 matches to play. And we certainly don't have a date yet for resumption, but we know it can't be before the 8th of June. The challenge here, if you're going to have matches behind closed doors, is that Switzerland's financial model, they don't actually make much money from TV broadcast and they can make up to 40% from gate receipts. So they're potentially big losses if they have to play behind closed doors. The English Premier League, the biggest league. 92 games to go, so that's teams have 9 and 10 matches each. Liverpool, 22 points clear of Manchester City. 
where are we here? Well, they're talking about maybe mid-June for the resumption and in a period of about 40 days. If they cancel, they said they could be exposed to losses, that's the clubs, of up to 1.2 billion Swiss francs. Spain, national lockdown to at least the 9th of May. They're talking about a possible restart right at the end of May. 11 matches to go, Barcelona leading at the moment. And they're also talking about a potential loss of a billion Swiss francs if the season can't go ahead at all. Germany. Some of the teams have had the players back in training for the last 10 days or so, obviously separated. There's going to be a meeting of the 36 clubs in the first and second division on the 23rd to decide where we go from here. Italy, clearly they were the first country to go into lockdown. Country lockdown till the 4th of May at least. Juventus leading the league at the moment. No definite news of where we're going to go and when we can restart. France. 10 matches to go. They're talking about a possible restart mid-June and really putting the matches quite quickly together once every three days. Belgium, a bit of an exception here. They've actually said we've finished the season because they'd had 29 of the 30 matches he'd played and so they've said enough's enough. And then we come to UEFA with all 55 national associations to look out for. The two key tournaments there, the Champions League and the Europa League, they're hopefully going to run them a little bit late this year with a potential final coming in Turkey for the Champions League on the 29th of August. In UEFA, they're going to have lots of meetings in the next few days. They're discussing via teleconference with the 55 associations on the 21st. And then there's due to be an executive board meeting on the 23rd. So lots of decisions to be made. Let's just hope it can be safely put together as soon as possible. Well, that's you all today, this uh, Monday. Just remember that you can catch everything. Full interviews are available as ever on our website, cnnmoney.ch. And we'll be back with more updates from tomorrow. Bye-bye.